Elliot Ramos, one of the Giants' top prospects, gets a surprising call-up three days into the season and immediately made an impact and helped the Giants win their first series of the year. So we'll break it all down next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily San Francisco Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to Locked On Giants, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. My name is Ben Kaspic, and on this show, we provide daily episodes Monday through Friday talking about the San Francisco Giants in a way that's data driven and rational, but also simple passionate and accessible to all. I'm a former contributor for the baseball statistics and analysis websites Beyond the Box Score and Rotographs. I've been podcasting about the Giants since 2015, and I'm a lifelong fan. Thanks for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. We're free and available wherever you get podcasts. And coming up on today's show, I want to talk about Elliot Ramos being promoted to the major leagues. What is he about? What did he help the Giants do on Sunday? And how long is he going to be here? I also want to talk about Logan Webb and Carlos Rodon, and also, also to an extent, Anthony DiSclefani. But man, Carlos Rodon in particular was absolutely filthy in his Giants debut. And then we're going to talk about the offense scuffling out of the gates a little bit. But uh, first, I want to talk about Elliot Ramos. So this caught everybody by surprise. We had a good feeling that eventually this season, Elliot Ramos was going to get an opportunity to make his major league debut. He had been added to the 40-man roster in the offseason, and he was ready to to debut as soon as he had some upper minors, specifically AAA, where he was starting out success. So a couple of games into the season, they call him up, and it was it was not something necessarily that was uh, planned in advance. They, they made the move as a corresponding move to John Brebbia going on the bereavement list. And so, I mean, the other... Uh, evidence that it was not necessarily planned exactly to the to the minute was that Ramos started Saturday night's game for AAA and was pulled after two plate appearances to be called up. And so anyway, uh, yeah, so the deal is he's one of the Giants' top prospects. He was their first-round pick in 2017. And here's the Fangraph scouting report on Elliot Ramos entering the 2022 season where he was ranked by Fangraphs as their 99th best prospect on their top 100 100 prospects list. Joey Bart, they actually had like 115 guys on this top 100. And so Elliot Ramos actually ranked ahead of Joey Bart on this year's edition of their top 100. But the quick one sentence summary is that Ramos is a well-rounded corner outfield prospect, period. And then the more uh, detailed blurb is that Ramos has been pushed aggressively through the Giants system, and even with the lost year of development, the missed 2020 season in the minors, he was among the younger players on the AA and AAA rosters he graced in 2021. That helps mitigate a ho-hum overall line of 254 average, 323 on base, 417 slugging across two levels. But Ramos, Pro- Ramos's prospect star clearly doesn't shine as brightly as it once did. While it's easy to call him a five-tool player, since he's competent in every aspect of the game, scouts struggle to figure out what Ramos's one true carrying tool is. His approach is solid but unspectacular. Some swing and miss issues leave his pure hit tool with an average grade, and his mechanics are tuned more for line drives than loft, leaving his in-game power in the 15 to 20 home run range. He's added significant bulk to his frame since being drafted in the first round of the 2017 draft, and he's now an average runner who is stretched in center field, though his arm is plenty good for right. Ramos feels like a slam dunk big leaguer down the road, but the path to stardom will require some unexpected leaps. So I think that Uh, Generally speaking, that's a positive, fair uh, write-up. Of course, the path to stardom, this is the type of organization you want to be in if you want to make those unexpected leaps. And so I would definitely refrain from saying, okay, that's what Fangraph says. End of story. This is who Elliot Ramos is. No, there's a lot to work with here. And I'll take 
competent in every aspect of the game as being like a negative kind of knock on him, right? That's that's you could do a lot worse than that as your uh, cold water kind of statement. But anyway, so Ramos gets called up, and and significantly, it was a left-handed starting pitcher, and they also project to face another left-handed starting pitcher in Sean Manaya on Wednesday in this upcoming series against the Padres. So Ramos started against the lefty and had two hits in his two at-bats against a good left-handed pitcher. By the way, we'll talk about that later. Marlins starting pitching showed up just like we expected. They're good, and they uh, were good in this series. But that's all the more reason you want another competent right-handed bat in the lineup against a lefty starter like they had yesterday. And Ramos got a two-out rally started with a single. He then scored on a double, showed off his speed, and then... Mauricio Dubon, who hit the double, scored on a single, and that was uh, the giant two of their runs. And so uh, he was instrumental in this win. And so the call-up, I mean, it may have literally changed yesterday's game from a really disappointing two to one or uh, one to nothing or two to nothing loss into a win. And so for Ramos, I would imagine he's not going to start on uh, Monday or Tuesday against the right-handed starters, but. When you're a bench player on the Giants, you almost you get into pretty much every game. And the example that I've used for this is that so far this season, Austin Slater has more plate appearances than Jock Peterson, even though Jock Peterson started twice and Slater only started once. That's because Slater is used every day. He's like the first guy off the bench right now against a left-handed reliever, but he doesn't start against a right-handed starter. So I would imagine that Ramos and Slater are going to be now their two most uh, aggressively used right-handed bats off the bench for now. And then also with Sean Manaya coming up on Wednesday, I would imagine Ramos gets back out there. So the point is they're not like pigeonholing him into a platoon. The idea is that you're putting him in a position to be comfortable and to succeed initially. And just like Slater has a few plate appearances against righties, you get your opportunities to face same-handed pitching. They come. Like when you make a start, like Ramos, he got the start against a lefty, but then he later got an at-bat against a righty when there was a reliever out there. Sometimes you pull them in certain big situations for the platoon advantage, but if the game is out of hand one way or the other, or if you want to save somebody for later, you don't pinch hit, and then they get their opportunities to prove themselves against same-handed pitching. And so I think that's a perfectly fine way to break somebody into the major leagues and it actually to me is better than the alternative because again you're putting them in positions to succeed they get to play every day it's not like they're rotting away on your bench he's gonna probably get into the game tonight even if he doesn't start Uh, the Padres feature at least one I'm looking up their pulling up their bullpen right now they've got one two relievers in their pen, Tim Hill and Taylor Rogers, who they just acquired right before the season, uh, Tyler Rogers' twin brother. So I would imagine Ramos doesn't start, but he's one of their first options off the bench, maybe in a critical ninth inning with the closer, Taylor Rogers on the mound. So anyway, it's a big deal that he's been called up. I wouldn't necessarily expect him to just automatically be here for the rest of his career and never get sent back down. They may send him back down, but it's a big deal that he gets the call. And it means, you know, we're going to see a lot of him throughout the course of the year if he can just hold his own, which he more than did in the first game. So congratulations to Ramos, just 22 years old. He's made it. Incorporating young players is going to be a big part of the season. Joey Bart is already here. Bart and Ramos are very good friends. Uh, Hopefully in one of these games, we get to see the two of them in the lineup together. I think that'd be pretty cool. Anyway, coming up next, we're going to turn the page and start talking about Logan Webb and Carlos Rodon specifically, and Rodon more specifically. My goodness, he was as advertised in his Giants debut. Is he one of the best pitchers in all of baseball? We'll talk about it in just a minute. But first, BetOnline is your number one source for all your sports betting stats and info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs, and the start of the Major League Baseball season. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. 
Head to the website today or, or move, use your mobile device to learn more about the transaction. Just this morning, uh, they put out odds on the first manager to be fired. And I thought it was interesting. Gabe Kapler was nowhere on the graphic that we had in the top at least 10 or 12 or close to 15 in terms of the odds of him being fired. And actually, number one, Aaron Boone. So you can check that out. Let me know if you agree or disagree, but that's over on Bet Online. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. All right, as promised, we're going to turn the page and talk about what we saw out of Carlos Rodon in this Giants debut. I just, I mean, I, I think a lot of people, baseball is kind of a regional sport, so a lot of those listening maybe know the name but haven't really seen much of Carlos Rodon. We've talked all off season. That's why uh, we mentioned him as a target for the Giants because of the type of dominant season that he had for the Chicago White Sox. And I think that what we saw out of him on Saturday was exactly that. I mean, as advertised, just we've talked about the best case scenario. If everybody's healthy, Webb and Rodon at the top can be co-aces. And my goodness, did that is that what it looked like in the first trip through that rotation? And then you've got Di Sclafani, who just gave up a ton of hits, which is uncharacteristic. And if you look at uh, some of the numbers, it's he's not going to give up hits at that rate all season. It's just not going to happen. And then you've got Alex Wood and Alex Cobb, and then you flip it back over. So we're already going to see that this starting rotation is a real strength, and I just hope everybody can stay healthy. But for Rodon specifically, I mean, he went out there, he threw five innings, and he had 12 strikeouts. He also had, what was it, 24 swings and misses, which was the most in baseball that day by a wide margin. And I believe... I wasn't able to find this on Baseball Savant, but I believe that's got to be or close to it the most any pitcher has had in any one game this season. So on Saturday, Rodon had 24 swings and misses. The next closest, guess who? Kevin Gosman for the Blue Jays had 17 swings and misses. Not even close. And Kyle Gibson had 16, but he went seven innings. Rodon did this in five innings. I think Gosman also only went five innings, but... I mean, overpowering, right? Upper 90s fastballs at the top of the zone. We also talked about when he signed his fastball, his four-seam fastball per baseball savant, uh, which is using stat cast data, uh, attaching a run value to your pitches. His four-seam fastball was the best pitch in Major League Baseball according to this run value metric last season. And I think we saw why, right? 99 at the top of the zone, just exploding out of his hand, and hitters just, they didn't have a chance in this game. If he threw it where he wanted to throw it, they couldn't do anything with it. They could not do anything with it. It was just blowing major league hitters away, which is very, very impressive. And then the slider is a devastating slider. So those two pitches, it's kind of a lethal combination. And he does have a changeup as well. I don't think he threw many, if any, changeups. I, I think he also... Broke out the curveball a little bit. Slider is like upper 80s for him, and the curveball was in the lower 80s. So I think it's a pitch that they want him to add, but obviously he's not going to uh, throw it unless he feels comfortable with it. But I think he threw it a couple times and caught some guys off guard with it. But man, somebody said not to call anybody out, but when the Giants signed him, that it re- that he reminded them of Barry Zito. And nothing could be further from the truth except for the fact that they're left-handed. Maybe the point was that it was a free agent starter and they didn't like the signing or something, or it was a lot of money, too much money. But no, Carlos Rodon is like an overpowering, dominant type of pitcher. That's At least that's what happened last year. And the way it happened, he went, or Ethan Katz, who was one of Gabe Kapler's original coaches, that coaching staff that got criticized so heavily, who have now gone on to be very much in demand. Ethan Katz gets hired away after just the short 2020 season to be the pitching coach for the Chicago White Sox. He was an assistant pitching coach here. Donnie Ecker, by the way, one of the Giants hitting coaches, goes to be the offensive coordinator and bench coach with the Rangers. And they have, I mean, I watched a lot of those Rangers games this weekend against the Blue Jays, and they were really hitting well up and down the lineup. And I really do believe Donnie Ecker makes that kind of impact, just like he did here. 
But anyway, Ethan Katz goes over to the White Sox, and then Rodon has this breakout season where his strikeout rate just shoots through the roof, and he looked dominant. And the only reason the Giants were able to get him on a two-year deal was because he has an injury past, and also last year his shoulder tired down the stretch. He had shoulder fatigue. They limited his innings. His velocity tanked. But then in the playoffs, his velocity was back up to the high 90s again. And so Giants don't think there's an injury there. And my goodness, did it not look like he was dealing with an injury in his start on Saturday. So if they can get anything close to that Carlos Rodon, just like consistently throughout the season, he could win the Cy Young Award. Logan Webb could win the Cy Young Award. They could both win the Cy... Okay, no, that's not that's not possible. But that's how good they could be. Now, Logan Webb is a different type of pitcher. He's not the same, like, overpowering, dominant strikeout stuff. But, I mean, the upside with Webb is tremendous as well. And he does it more with a mix of swing and miss and also ground balls. So anyway, Webb was really good as well. Anthony DiSclefani gave up a lot of hits, like I said, but that's not really necessarily going to continue at that rate. But one through, the, uh, one not one turn through, but three pitchers, one series through the Giants' starting rotation, and they're, they've been as advertised, I would say. So we'll see how Alex Wood and Alex Cobb fare in these first two games and then back, you know, turn it over again to, uh, to Logan Webb and Carlos Rodon. And so that's going to be a strength of this team, I swear. Anyway, coming up next, let's talk about the Giants' offense. They... You know, this is one area where people were concerned coming into the year. And in the first series of the year, obviously a small sample, they didn't really hit all that well. So uh, what is my level of concern with the Giants offense and how does Elliot Ramos factor into that? So we'll break that down in just a minute. But first, this is the time of year I've pretty much way given up on my New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm sticking to it thanks to Built Bar. It almost feels like it's not really a resolution because I actually enjoy eating them. Have you tried the Puffs yet? If you haven't, you are missing out on one of Bilt Bar's best tasting bars. Puffs are the first ever protein infused marshmallow. They're fluffy, they're marshmallowy, they're not just a protein bar, they're a treat and they're covered in 100% real chocolate. Low calorie, high protein. Replace your candy bars with these. They're better. A typical candy bar can be anywhere from two to 300 calories and upwards of 20 plus grams of sugar, whereas most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and 17 grams of protein. Go to Built.com, use promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, as promised, we're going to talk a little bit about the Giants offense, which did definitely struggle somewhat in this series against the Marlins. We'll talk about the numbers, what's sustainable and what's not, and what I would expect kind of moving forward. So the Giants in this series and on the season have a 183 batting average, a 260 on base, and a 333 slugging, a 77 weighted runs created plus, which is 23rd out of 30 teams in Major League Baseball. It's nice, by the way, I no longer have to say, not counting pitchers. You can't count pitchers in the National League and then count pitchers or count pitchers in the NL and not count them in the AL and then compare those teams. Great that we don't have to do that anymore. And has anyone really missed the pitcher batting? If, if anything, I've noticed that I miss it when my team is pitching. You look forward to that spot in the lineup and being able to navigate it and get get out of some innings that way by getting the pitcher spot up. But not having that, you just have to get guys out. So on the offensive side, I don't miss it at all. But anyway, Giants rank 23rd. Right above them is the Dodgers, like one point above them in weighted runs created plus. They just lost two out of three to the Rockies, who are going to be one of the worst teams in baseball probably, or at least among them, uh, in Denver and had a hard time scoring runs. So I wouldn't be all that concerned. The Dodgers, yeah, they've scored 11 runs, and the Giants have 10, and the Dodgers are playing in Coors Field. So I'm not worried about the Dodgers, and I'm not worried about the San Francisco Giants. So it is like way too early to to really be looking at these numbers with any kind of critical eye. I would say, again, we need about two and a half, excuse me, one and a half months or two months, 45 games is what I'm trying to say, roughly until we can really take a hard look at some numbers and start having a 
somewhat decent uh, opinion about the state of the team. And that, you know, that extends to more than just the offense. We're also talking about the pitchers as well. But when we look at the individual performers, Brandon Crawford and Mike Yastrzemski haven't gotten it going. Neither has Wilmer Flores. Kurt Casale hitless in his three trips to the plate. Austin Slater hasn't really gotten it going. But some of these guys have hit the ball hard. Austin Slater has hit a few balls hard that have just not found any real estate out there, and they have found gloves. Jock Peterson has smoked some balls that have been caught as well. The The best Giants hitters so far have basically been uh, Joey Bart and Elliot Ramos. Also, Brandon Belt has done his thing a little bit, but struck out 44% of the time. Tyro Estrada, how about his clutch game-tying home run in the ninth inning on Friday in the in the opener in on opening day and Darren Ruff has hit into some bad luck but overall been a positive contributor Luke Williams and Mauricio Dubon how about them for a second they played a key role in the win yesterday and had everything to do with their platoon system these are not guys who had otherwise started and I think a lot of people wanted Dubon DFA'd to make room for Elliot Ramos but Given that he's out of options, I don't think they're going to just DFA him based on a boneheaded base running mistake. I have said when we went into the season kind of previewing last year's results based on offense, defense, and pitching, the one thing that I could really point to as a negative for this team last year was base running. And so far, the base running has not been good again. And on opening day, they made several base running mistakes. I think three. Darren Ruff got picked off second base by the catcher. Uh, Mauricio Dubon got caught in between, like, tagging up and going back on a fly ball to right field from second base in extra innings, which could have been very costly. But Austin Slater with a walk-off double with Darren Ruff scoring from first saved the day. And... The bullpen has been, some guys have been shaky. And on opening day, I mean, Camilo Duvall blew a two-run ninth inning lead. They've blown a couple of leads late, but I'm just not really all that worried about that group. And yesterday they hung tough and uh, the bullpen finished strong. And it was some guys like uh, Harleen Garcia making his season debut, two and a third, just really good innings, pitching against his former team. And Dominic Leon closing it out in the ninth, uh, again, it's a fluid bullpen mix. Leon is probably not one of their top three options, but uh, McGee and Rogers and Doval were unavailable for that ninth. I, D- Rogers had just pitched the pitched the eighth and only thrown four pitches, but he didn't go back out there, and it was Leon. But that's kind of the beauty of this team and this bullpen is that they're interchangeable parts and. You're not overly reliant on any one person in any one kind of rigid role. They can move around, and Leon did that some last year, so I didn't really have... Obviously, you'd rather have a dominant Doval, but Doval has been shaky himself. So Leon, who had given up some runs and a lead, I think, on opening day, came back out there on Sunday and and finished it out and looked really nasty in the process. So I'm not worried about this team at all, and I think they gutted out a tough series win against a scrappy Marlins team that always plays the Giants tough like this. And a win is a win is a win. And it's a series win for the Giants. And now it's on to the Padres, who are coming off winning three out of four against the lowly Arizona Diamondbacks. And really, they should have swept. They had a lead in the ninth inning of the first game and blew it. But we're going to see Nick Martinez coming over from Japan today after spending a few years in Japan he previously pitched in the major league. So he's he's an interesting guy, and it'll be fascinating to see how Nick Martinez looks. And then the the pitching rotation is going to flip over, and we're going to see you Darvish and Sean Manaya. So arguably, you know, good starting pitching again. So it, runs could be hard to come by again. It's going to be cold and windy tonight. So again, it's too early to judge this offense, and don't judge them based on facing some of the top pitchers in the game. But maybe tonight they can get to Nick Martinez making his first major league appearance in a number of years. Although, again, he he was good in Japan, and that's why they brought him back over to the United States. So anyway, that's all the time we have for today. Coming up tomorrow, we're going to be talking about 
another baseball game. The beauty of the season, games every day. We're with you every single Monday through Friday, all season long, and for much of the offseason, every day as well. And then we do go to three days a week at some points in the offseason, but we're with you basically year-round here on Locked on Giants. Thanks again for making Locked on Giants your first listen every day. Now make your second listen, Locked on MLB. Paul Francis Sullivan, please call him Sully, brings you his unique perspective on the major leagues past and present. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Once again, my name is Ben Kaspik. Check me out on Twitter at Ben Kaspik, K-A-S-P-I-C-K. If you like this show, please consider rating it or leaving a review. It helps me out a lot. So thank you in advance and thank you to everyone who's done so already. I can't wait to be with you again tomorrow. Alex Wood on the mound for the Giants, by the way, tonight. So thanks again for listening. Stay locked on Giants.